Hello, everyone. Welcome to Spotlight session number two. We are happy to have uh, two amazing talks today. Uh, the first talk is going to be on fair uh, assortment planning by Chin Yi Chen, the speaker, Negin Goldrezai, Francesca Suzanne, and Eddie Boscoro, followed by a discussion by Denis Sar. Uh, with that, I would like to give the microphone to the speaker. Let me just say one thing that uh, the questions are going to happen during the chat. So leave your question in the chat. Uh, if there is a substantial question, we are gonna have five minutes at the end of the talk for Q&A. Uh, if it is clarifying question, and it's needed to be asked from the speaker during the talk, I will try to relay the question to the speaker, but I do my best to leave the speaker uninterrupted. And the speakers, they have 25 minutes to give the talk and there will be, as I said, five minutes uh, for questions at the end, uh, followed by the discussion. All right, so our first speaker, Chin Yi Chen, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Rat, for the introduction. Um, let me first share my screen right here. Um, all right. Okay, you are seeing my slides okay? Okay, cool. So hello everyone, uh, my name is Ching Yi uh, and I'm a PhD student from MIT. And today I'm really happy to be talking about our work on fair assortment planning. And this is joint work with my advisor Negin from MIT, uh, as well as Susan also from MIT and Addis Bascaro from ITB. Now, um, before I start, I want to first share a few motivating examples for this work. So there are many online platforms nowadays that uses some kind of algorithm to try to help them make different kinds of assortment planning decisions. And one such example is in online marketplaces such as Amazon. So for example, if you search for um, coffee machines on Amazon, this is the result that you're going to see. So on the left, this coffee machine is going to be something that's featured as Amazon's choice. So it's something that you're going to see on page one of, and line one of Amazon's website. And this right coffee machine right here, on the other hand, is something that you're only going to find on page two and in the middle of the page. Um, but so if you look at these two coffee machines, because this one here has way more purchases than the other, and this is probably why their algorithm makes a choice to feature this coffee machine right here. But if you compare them a little bit further, you will see that they are actually pretty similar in terms of their ratings as well as their prices. But as a uh, result of the choice that the algorithm makes, this left coffee machine right here is certainly getting much higher user exposure. While this right coffee machine right here is receiving a low and somewhat unfair amount of user exposure. And there are actually a number of consequences that might arise due to the choice that the algorithm is making. Uh, on one hand, it certainly reduces a lot of user exposure for the items that are not featured like this coffee machine right here. And in the long run, this kind of practice might actually hurt this online platform because it might actually induce those um, products that are not featured uh, to just leave the platform overall. So I want to emphasize that this also might introduce this kind of um, rich getting richer phenomenon uh, in the sense that uh, only those products that are featured are getting seen by more and more customers, while this product right here that are not featured are actually not going to receive like enough uh, exposure or customer clicks. Now, I also want to stress that this kind of rich getting richer phenomenon that I just talked about um, can actually be seen everywhere, not just like on uh, Amazon, but in different kinds of online platforms. And one such example is in job recommendation sites such as LinkedIn. Um, so LinkedIn was trying to use this kind of algorithm that would actually prioritize those uh, candidates who have a lot of connections in the first place and try to connect those people to more other job candidates or job postings. Well, for those people and users who do not have a lot of connections in the first place, uh, they might actually get, in, get left out of this um, networking cycle. Uh, another example I want to mention is in social networks such as Instagram. So many small business owners are trying to use Instagram to do marketing or advertising, but the algorithm used by Instagram usually tends to feature contents that Instagram believes are more popular among its users, such as those videos um, made with very fancy um, filtering effects, for example. But a lot of small business owners, they do not really have the skills or equipment to make such kind of uh, contents. And that is why their postings are not really recommended to enough 
TikTok users. And that is why they are now losing faith in Instagram, as this um, New York Times piece article suggests, uh, uh, because of the choice that the algorithm makes, and they might want to just leave the platform. Now, having seen all of that, this actually motivates us to ask the following research question, which is, is it possible for us to design some kind of fair assortment planning algorithm that would help us treat items, whether they are Amazon products or job candidates or postings in a fair manner? And when I say fair, what I mean right here is I want any two similar items to get similar amount of visibility or exposure. Now, let me formally define what I mean right here um, by first introducing our model. So in our model, we consider an online platform with n items, each indexed by i. And each item i is given some kind of popularity weight wi. And the sale of this item is going to generate some kind of revenue ri. Now, if a customer is offered some assortment S, this customer will be choosing item I in S with the probability um, WI divided by one plus the sum of WIs in S, uh, which is exactly the multinomial logic model. Now, here in our problem, the platform has two twofold goals. So on one hand, they wanted to select some assortment S that contains at most K items which either maximizes the market share, which is this term right here that represents the probability that some item uh, in our offer assortment is chosen by the customer or the expected revenue, which is expect, uh, this term right here. So I want to note that uh, you can kind of think about the market share as a special case of this expected revenue term right here, because you can just take those RIs to be one. So in the following, I'm going to primarily focus on the expected revenue uh, objective. Now, the platform, as I have just mentioned, also has a second goal, which is to ensure fairness for all of its items. And uh, when I say fairness, um, I, what I mean right here is a pairwise notion of fairness. And let me define what I mean right here by pairwise. So here, let us first denote this PS to be the probability that this platform offers some assortment S. And we let this VI term to be the visibility of item I, which is the sum of the PS for all of the I's in S. So you can think of it as the probability that item I is gonna be seen by one of the customers. And here we also consider this QI function, which could depend on WI and RI to be some arbitrary measure of quality or merit of this item I. So, I, so here we assume this form of this QI function is none, but we don't really care what exact form it takes. So it can be some increasing function of either WI or RI or both, but we don't really care about the form and our framework will apply unanimously. So what I mean by pairwise notion of fairness is that we want each item to have the same visibility to quality ratio, meaning that this kind of equality should hold. So if you think about it, this would exactly mean that if two items have similar quality, then they will be receiving similar amount of visibility. So this is the thing that we want to enforce fairness into the system. But at the same time, we also realize that this kind of fairness condition might be too strict for the platform to um, enforce in practice. So we additionally introduce this delta parameter right here that we call the fairness parameter so, and modify our condition to be something like this. So here, um, if you increase this delta, basically you are relaxing the fairness condition a little bit and, um, and yeah, so making things a little bit less fair in the system. So having defined all of that, um, we are ready to arrive at the optimization problem faced by this platform, which can be formulated uh, as a linear program that looks like this. So here we have uh, the objective being maximizing our expected revenue. And the first set of constraints that we have are the fairness constraints. And the second constraint is simply uh, asking us to have a legit probability distribution. Now, I want to first remark that if we are given a problem without those fairness constraints, then essentially there will exist some single optimal assortment that we should always just offer to the customers, which usually would include some items with high uh, quality or uh, popularity weights or um, uh, revenue. But uh, if you think uh, for a second, this might be super unfair for all the items that are not included in this assortment because they're essentially receiving visibility zero while they do have some kind of quality associated with them. 
So that is why we are choosing to consider a randomization of different assortments right here. And the difficulty associated with this linear program right here is that there are exponentially many sets that we need to consider. So it's not really obvious to us what's like a good way to solve this linear program right here. And this is exactly the thing that we want to tackle today. Now, before I talk about our approaches, uh, let me first give a very brief summary of our contributions. So in this project, we mainly, did, um, so we, we introduced a very novel pairwise fairness notion to study this fair assortment planning problem that I just talked about. And as we have seen, uh, I have already formulated this problem as an LP with exponentially many variables. And in a minute, I'm going to show you that there's a, there exists an optimal solution that allows us to simply randomize over a polynomial number of sets. And to find such a solution or its near optimal solution, we introduced a fair ellipsoid-based framework uh, that depends on both the ellipsoid algorithm as well as a beta approximate separation article for the dual problem to the LP that we have just seen. And to design the separation article right here, I'm going to then show that it is equivalent to solving an infinite series of knapsack problems. And then I'm going to move on to introduce a half approximate algorithm and a p-test when we are trying to maximizing the expected revenue function. Uh, in our paper, we additionally actually have a fp-test for maximizing market share. Now, finally, I will conclude this talk with a case study on the movie lens data set. Now, before I proceed, I also want to very briefly mention some related work on fairness to just give you some idea what has been done in different areas. So fairness has been studied in many different areas or, uh, in recent years. And one such area is in supervised and online learning. And these works mainly study fairness in terms of either individual fairness or group fairness or subgroup fairness. And our work is more closely related to the individual fairness setting in the sense that we wanted to treat each item fairly. But again, we differ a lot from these works because we're not really doing things in a learning setting, but in an op assortment optimization setting. The second area I want to mention are works that study fairness in terms of resource allocation, uh, either in terms of static ones or dynamic ones. So our work, you can think of it to be kind of similar to the static resource allocation in the sense that we are allocating this intangible resource uh, that we call visibility. But again, we are the primarily focus on assortment planning uh, and it, there are like still a lot of differences between our setting and those resource allocation problems. So finally, there are people who study fairness in terms of ranking. Uh, this is more closely related to assortment planning because assortment planning can somewhat be thought of as a special case of ranking problem in the sense that maybe we can just offer the top ranked items. And these works also consider a similar notion of fairness in the sense that they want each similar items to get similar exposure. But these works mainly differ from ours in the sense that they are pretty empirical and do not provide lots of theoretical guarantees, uh, while our main focus is to actually give near optimal algorithms with theoretical guarantees. So uh, now uh, I want to proceed to talk about our approach to tackling this problem that I just talked about. And the first thing, as I promised, that I want to show you is that there actually exists some optimal solution that allows us to randomize over a polynomial number of sets. And in our case, which is O of n squared sets, as shown by this theorem right here. And this is a really nice property to have because it eases the pressure that the platform has when they were trying to implement this solution. Um, so one natural question that we want to ask ourselves is, whether we can find such an optimal solution that has this really nice property right here. And if you recall, like the optimization problem that we have just seen is difficult because it comes with exponentially many variables. So our first thought right here is that perhaps we can just take a look at its dual problem to transform things into exponentially many constraints and to see if there is like an easy way for us to check those constraints. And that's exactly what we are about to do. So here, let us first take a look at this dual problem right here, uh, which is uh, this problem fair dual. So let me decipher things a little bit for you. So these zijs are the dual, um, dual variables associated with the fairness constraint in the primal problem. And this row right here is the dual variable associated with the probability distribution constraint. 
So here we do have exponentially uh, many constraints that we need to consider, which we call the dual fairness constraints. But if you look at this seemingly very complicated term, you can think of this part as the fairness cost of associated with item one if you wanted to include it in the assortment. And then this term right here, you can just think of it as the cost adjusted revenue term, which is simply the revenue generated by assortment S minus all the fairness costs of items in S. So really this very complicated constraint can be simplified to be something like this. And it is really obvious to us that as long as we can maximize this cost adjusted revenue term right here, then we can very easily check those dual fairness constraints. And then perhaps uh, this problem can be solved easily. And in particular, uh, if we can check those constraints uh, very easily, then this can serve as a separation oracle that tells us whether the constraints are satisfied or not. And we can use it as part of the ellipsoid method which can then just give us access to a solution to both the dual problem as well as the primal problem. Um, the problem is, uh, unfortunately, we show that maximizing this cost adjusted revenue function is going to be an NP complete problem. So there's really no trivial way for us to solve this problem in polynomial time. So we have to modify our plan a little bit right here. So our second saw right here is, perhaps we can take a step back and simply design some beta approximate polynomial time algorithm for this maximization problem. And if we have this kind of beta approximation problem, then we essentially have a beta approximate separation oracle that we can again use as part of the ellipsoid method. And this together with the ellipsoid method is actually going to give us access to a beta approximate solution to this primal problem right here in polynomial time. And what's even nicer is that this near optimal solution is going to allow us to only randomize over a polynomial number of steps. So this is exactly the nice property that we were looking for in the first place. So now our plan has become something like this. And all there's left to do is to design this beta approximate um, algorithm for this maximization problem right here. All right, so now I'm going to shift things a little bit and talk about how we do this part. And the first step that I'm going to take is to show you that this maximization problem right here is actually equivalent to solving an infinite series of next step problems. And in particular, this next step problem that I'm talking about is going to take a form that looks like this. So if you look at this knapsack problem right here, you see that it's, um, it's both constrained in terms of capacity W as well as cardinality K. But what's special right here is that when we are maximizing the utility of items in the knapsack, the utility of item I actually depends on many different things. So they depend on RI, QI, as well as this fairness called CI. But uh, most importantly, it also depends on this capacity W right here. And um, what's surprising to us is that with this very special knapsack problem, we are actually able to show that this maximization problem of this um, cost adjusted revenue function is going to be equivalent to solving this maximization problem of those knapsack problems for all of the w's greater than or equal to zero. So this is pretty nice to us because now if we can find some nice solution for this problem, then we have the solution to this problem. But again, there are two level of difficulties that we need to take into account. Uh, the first thing is, so since we have an infinite number of knapsack problems, we cannot really expect to solve them one by one. And the second thing is, because the utility terms now depend on this um, capacity W, the utility will actually decrease as the capacity increase. So it's really difficult for us to just say like, for which of these W we are achieving the maximum of these knapsack problems. And that's exactly the thing that we want to answer uh, using our near optimal algorithm. Now, let me first talk about in a uh, half approximate algorithm for those infinite series of knapsack problems, uh, which is based on some interesting ideas. Um, in particular, let us first take a step back and think about what we want to do if we are now given a single knapsack problem where this W is now fixed uh, before we think about like an infinite number of them. So there actually exists a very simple half approximate algorithm uh, for a single knapsack problem. 
And the first thing that one would do is they would try to obtain an optimal basic solution to the relaxed version of this knapsack problem. So for example, if this is the knapsack we are considering and we have like six items right here and say that we solve the relaxed version of the knapsack problem and we know the optimal basic solution looks something like this, where one and two are fully added, three and four like are partially added and five and six are not added. We then make a very important definition, which we call the profile PW of this optimal basic solution, which consists of three sets, P1, PF, and P0. So this P1 set simply uh, includes the indices of items that are fully added to the knapsack. PF include the items that are fractionally added to the knapsack, and P0 are the items that are not included in the knapsack in the optimal basic solution. And this profile is going to be a very important thing for us because it has a lot of nice properties. The first property is that there are, will be at most two items in this PF set. And what's more important is that as long as we know the profile for this um, optimal basic solution for the relaxed problem, we can actually just use it to help us determine what's a half approximate solution for the integer knapsack problem that we were considering. And that's the thing that, that is going to help us a lot as we now solve an infinite series of knapsack problems. Uh, so, so Chini, you have four to five minutes left. Okay, yeah. So uh, let me see. So yeah, so to solve this infinite knapsack problems, uh, I want to stress that there are two findings that are going to help us a lot. The first thing that finding that we are using is this thing that I just talked about. And the second thing is that when W changes from zero to infinity, uh, the profile actually only going to change a polynomial number of times. And this is a really important finding for us because naturally we would think about, okay, maybe now we can just divide the entire thing from zero to infinity into polynomial number of steps such that on each of these sub intervals, maybe the profile does not change. And then we can just use our knowledge of the profile uh, to determine what's a half approximate solution for each of these sub intervals and then problem solved. Right, so the only problem is we do not really know what these sub intervals are in advance. So we really need to um, actually try to figure them out, out while we were solving this problem. And our solution is going to be via adaptive partitioning. So uh, let me go through uh, what adaptive partitioning means by a very simple example right here. So at the beginning of each such sub-interval where the profile does not change, the profile is always going to take a form that looks like this, where the PF set is empty. So the items are either all in P1 or in P0. And there exist two items, uh, one of them from P1 and the other from P0, such that if we swap them and increase the blue by a little bit, this will actually give us the highest marginal increase in utility. Now, uh, for example, right here, this is uh, item two right here, this is item five right here. Now, if we increase the blue little by little, um, this uh, what, what's going to happen is that in the profile, the fraction of this item two is gonna slightly decrease and the fraction of this item five is gonna slightly increase. And they are going to both enter this PF set right here as we increase W in this subinterval. And the sign that this end of the subinterval is reached is going to be seen when this item two is fully added to this item to this set P0 right here. And when this item five is fully added to this uh, P1 set right here. So this is the point when we know that the end of the sub interval is reached and it is time to just repeat the same process to find the net profile for the next sub interval. And that's exactly how adaptive partitioning works. And uh, finally, this, this idea that I just talked about gave us the desired approximation ratio of one half right here, given by this algorithm. And also what's even nicer is that the running time of this algorithm is indeed uh, polynomial in terms of N and K. So that's exactly what we wanted. Now, having talked about the half approximate algorithm, I also want to very, very briefly mention that with the help of this half approximate algorithm, we are actually going to be able to design a p-test 
for those knapsack problems as well. And the idea of the p-test is basically to enumerate over all of the subsets of the collection of n items that are of a sufficiently small size, and then um, solve a number of sub-knapsack problems uh, using this half approximation algorithm right here. Right, so, um, so yeah, so right, uh, so Red, how so you have a, You have a minute left, you have okay. one minute left. So maybe let me skip my case study right here. And I just want to may maybe talk about like the main message behind the case study is that we actually investigated the price of fairness uh, on real world data set. So we basically applied our near optimal algorithm on a real world data set to see what's the price, what's the impact of fairness in terms of the market share, as well as the number of sets that we need to randomize over uh, in the real world solution. And what the main takeaway right here is that uh, the market, the, even when our um, platform is being super fair on its solutions, the market, its impact on market share, as well as the number of sets to randomize over is actually not going to be that big for the platform to handle. So uh, the main message that we want to send through this numerical study is that, um, that imposing fairness onto a system is actually not going to hurt the platform a lot in terms of other objectives. So yeah, so that's the thing. I, maybe I'll skip right here, and then I'll just jump straight to the conclusion right here, given the limited time. So in this talk, um, we study a fair assortment planning problem with a novel pairwise fairness notion. And then we propose a fair ellipsoid-based framework that give us near optimal solutions to this problem, which is plotted in this thing right here uh, that I hope you to remember. Um, and then uh, in this talk, I talk briefly touched on a half approximate algorithm and a p-test when we're trying to maximizing our expected revenue. But in our paper, we also presented a fp-test when we are maximizing our market share. And in our case study that I have didn't have time to show you, uh, I want to, you to remember that fairness can actually be imposed at very little cost to the platform. So our main goal with this work, I guess, is just to try to inspire many online platforms to actually take fairness into account uh, when they are trying to make their operational decisions. And yeah, so I guess this concludes my talk. Um, thank you very much. And if you have questions, you can ask right now or email me uh, here and here's a link to our paper. Excellent, let's, let's thank the speaker first. All right. Uh, so we have three questions in the chat. Uh, let me relate them to you. So the first one, uh, Chao Zhang is asking, how to define that two products have similar merits so that you want them to have similar visibility? Right, so I think that would um, relate back to my definition for, uh, for the fairness notion that I just talked about. Okay, let me see if I can stop share. Right. So I think this will relate back to my pairwise fairness notion, uh, notion of fairness that I described right here. So when I say two products have similar merits, what I really mean is that if two products have a similar value of this quality uh, function right here, then I want them to actually be given a similar um, value of visibility term right here. So um, if you think about it, say that, um, say that I have like five products and I can only offer three products, uh, then, but item three and four have similar value of quality, then if my sole goal is to uh, maximize, say, my market share, maybe I will only offer the top three products, but this will be super unfair for the fourth product because it has a similar quality with the third product, but it's not offered in the assortment. And I, what I'm trying to do in this work is that I want to make sure that these two products are given similar level of visibility, meaning that they have the same chance to be seen by the customer. All right, thanks. Uh, so next question. So Ali Awad has a clapping question and also a more substantial question. Mm -hmm. uh, so Ali's question is what the definition of fairness? Uh, so you say the relative deviation from fairness is allowed to depend on the probability of visibility. Could you please explain this again? Again, just to refine, I have it in front of me. So just to refine, um, when you relax the constraint with delta, mm -hmm. um, did you kind of have thoughts in terms of a multiplicative error that could scale with VJ? So in a sense that the ratio between these things could be, you know, between uh, one minus delta and one plus delta or something. So 
uh, was it motivated? The fact that you chose this definition, was it motivated by computation or um, you just thought it was the best notion to use here? So I think the delta thing will not really um, uh, affect things a lot right here. Um, so if I understand the, so just to make sure that I understand, uh, understand your question correctly. So you're trying to say that there are different ways that I can introduce this uh, relaxation. Okay, so yeah, I guess uh, we choose this delta right here mainly because we wanted to formulate it as like a linear program that <laughs> we can kind of relax in some sense. But um, I want to emphasize that this delta wouldn't really make a lot of differences right here because even if you relax it in a different way, uh, this would own, this again would just be like a numerical number that you can control. And I can actually show you a plot that shows you what's the effect of delta right here. So uh, say that I was doing something in terms of like the real world experiments, and this is what you're going to see in terms of the visibility that the items are getting uh, in comparison the, to the delta that you are using. And you can see that this delta roughly serves as like a threshold. So after this delta increases the young certain threshold, some of the items are now going to get zero visibility and some of them are going to get like very high visibility. So this is again, like a numerical number that you can control. I don't think um, theoretically it will affect things a lot, even if you use like a different notion of like relaxation. All right, thanks Chen Yi. In the interest of time, uh, I'm gonna skip the two remaining questions. There is time in the break for asking those, feel free to find Chen Yi and uh, she would be happy, I guess, to answer your question. Thank All you. right. Uh, so let's move to the discussion. We are happy to have uh, Denis Sare to uh, tell us more about this paper. So Denis, with that, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, hopefully you're seeing my screen. Are you? Yes? Okay, cool. Uh, okay, so in the interest of time, I'm going to try to make this very brief. Um, oops, there you go. Uh, okay, so let me summarize the contributions of, of this paper. The, the main contribution, I think, it is that they they introduce fairness into the in the concept of fairness into assortment planning. Okay, they do it. Um, borrowing this concept of, of pairwise uh, visibility uh, from the ranking literature, I, I would think. And, and uh, uh, there is a bunch of assumptions made here that need to be unpacked <clears throat> into motivating this, this, this setup. Essentially, what this is, is assumed that uh, somehow the, the sellers are able to somehow manage, monitor the, the exposition and they care about visibility, right? Uh, which which could lead to an unfairness in another sense. So you could have a, a, a fair solution in terms of, of this concept, but uh, it could be that one product is offered next to the most popular item and the other one is, is offered as a singleton. So you have a similar exposure for two items, but in terms of market share, they will be very, very uh, unequal, right? So it, it it, it's a it's a first it's uh, the merit is in the introducing the the fairness concept but it needs to be uh, unpacked and and it's a it's a hard problem because a summer plan is is, is uh, operates in a complex ecosystem in which you have to uh, uh, account for for example um, search costs right if if not giving more uh, visibility to some sellers is is bad in the long term, that somehow implies that you would like to have more sellers. But having a lot of sellers will lead you to an an, an choice overload problem. So there's a lot of things that are being unpacked here. But uh, in terms of introducing the concept of uh, fairness in the assortment planning problem, this is a, a, a nice contribution. And one of the those contributions is to introduce this problem, the fair problem, right? Um, and particularly in its uh, linear programming formulation, I know it has a, a, a exponential number of constraints. But one of the of the also awesome contributions of this paper is showing that there is an optimal solution with a limited time of uh, number of of assortments that receive a, a positive uh, visibility, right? Probability. So it's good. Uh, and from here, there is a multiple uh, research for future directions. For example, one, one could tackle different type of approaches for solving this problem. 
Uh, upon seeing this problem, I would think, okay, maybe one can attack this by a uh, column generation problem, which is kind of like the dual of what the authors uh, end up doing. But uh, there is there is hope in in trying a uh, column generation approach, given that you know that there is an optimal solution with a limited number of of of, of solutions. So that, that's that's something very interesting. And one of the the things that I find I found most interesting in the approach that the authors adopted is that. Their separation oracle actually it's a it's a common problem. Or at least I've seen it a couple of times in 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 my work. It's a it's a form of a multi arm sorry a, a multinomial logic demand problem with fixed cost. Okay, so essentially you are trying to maximize uh, in in the simplest case you are trying to maximize the market share of the assortment that you are receiving, but there is a cost of introducing a, a an item. Right, so it's this is a common. Problem uh, it shows up in contracting when you uh, assume multinomial logic demand. Uh, it, it shows up in competition uh, setup. So this is a, 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 a nice formulation. And at this point, at the point in which they adopt their dual algorithm to solve the problem, this paper becomes a really nice uh, study of this problem and an, and an approximation algorithm for this problem. Okay, so. On top of solving the, the fairness problem for our summer planning, they're also solving this problem, which is, which is maximizing uh, market share subject to fixed costs. So that's a, a, a nice uh, contribution. Uh, I have a, a place for it here, mono, monotonicity of the solution. One of the things that may end up helping coming up with better approaches is to show some sort of property in terms of monotonicity of the solution. What would expect that uh, products with a higher um, quality should be shown more uh, that products with a lesser quality. Uh, I would expect that, but at least in the numerical solutions, there were uh, in the graph that you uh, thinking show there was a, an exception to that monotonicity, although it was based on the solution to the to the approximations. It might be the case that once you uh, actually come up with the same plot with looking at the optimal solution, you you observe that monotonicity. Again, that's something that needs to be further researched. Because it could help uh, developing uh, other type of approaches. Um, so one of the one of the the, the approaches that they took was to uh, try to solve this uh, logic demand with fixed cost, uh, looking over all positive all possible weights of the total assortment that you're solving. And an alternative approach will be to actually uh, parameterize the problem in terms of the cost of the fixed uh, assortment. This will lead to another type of uh, solution approach with a different type of approximation algorithm. So that's something also worth uh, exploring. Um, and one final thing that I would like to say is that you have to make a, a distinction between the theoretical complexity of the problem and the practical complexity of the problem. All the work here is devoted to show the theoretical complexity and, and the algorithms are uh, somewhat guided by uh, the fact that the problem is, com is at least really complex. Uh, but I would like to see in the future uh, work in which you maybe just go and try, uh, the, for example, the optimal approach. In the experiments that are in the paper, they try with uh, assortments of size, sorry, the, the, the total number of the of products is, is 20. Maybe you, you can just try uh, and, and plug this into a into a LP solver and see if something comes out in a in a decent amount of time, right? Uh, why? Because uh, linear solvers are quite developed. Uh, computer uh, GPUs are quite uh, fast this time. So problems with with a uh, hundred thousand constraints in this case a uh, hundred thousand uh, variables might be actually uh, faster to solve than the the PITAS approximation with takes uh, about half a minute I saw in the in the paper. So maybe this also could be done. Uh, and besides, it uh, gives you the, the benchmark you want to try to, to um, uh, overcome. Um, this is particularly important in this, in this setting because what you're solving is a one-shot problem, right? It's not a dynamic setup, a setting. Maybe you want to solve this type of problem, I don't know, once a day, once a week, once a month. So it's not something that you need to be solving on, on real time, right? And this leads me to, to future directions. Uh, in the paper, are uh, one of the future directions uh, mentioned is what happens when you take this problem into a dynamic setting. In that setup, yes, 
sure you want to solve this uh, maybe in, uh, in real time. Um, one aspect for future direction is what's the impact on top of this setup, what's the impact of being able to customize your assortment? Because customization itself is gonna help you deal with, with lessening the effects of, of having to import, impose fairness, right? So there's a, it, it's a very interesting paper. It poses a, an interesting problem as part of, a, of one of the sub problems that they uh, study is this problem of maximizing market share with fixed costs. And this proposes a reasonable, reasonable uh, approximation algorithm for that problem. Uh, there is a lot of, of future research uh, back here uh, in trying to develop in additional algorithms for solving that problem. And also there's a lot of work doing in trying to uh, coming up with perhaps alternative measures of fairness um, besides just visibility. For example, what happens when, when fairness is imposed in terms of market shares instead of just visibility? Because at the end of the day, maybe uh, sellers are not even able to monitor visibility, but what they end up caring about is the market share that they realize. And that's my, uh, uh, my discussion for this paper. Thank you. Thanks, Denise. Let's thank our discussant again. All right. Uh, we have some time, so how about uh, I continue relaying some of the questions that we had in the chat. Uh, so, Chinyi, would sure, you like sure. to continue asking? All right. Yeah, yeah. Let's do that. Uh, so, Omar al Husseini asks, uh, can you ensure feasibility of your problem for any fairness parameter delta? Is feasibility only guaranteed if you offer singletons? So, uh, yeah, so the feasibility does hold for any fairness parameter delta, because if you think about it, delta, when delta equals zero, this problem is, uh, has the least like feasibility region essentially. But yeah, in that case, you can ensure fairness by just off, like just offering singletons will give you a feasible solution, at least in that case. Um, but, yeah. but it's not the case that feasibility only guaranteed if you offer singletons, right? No, that's not the, that's not the case. Um, right. So there's a chance that you might actually have another feasible solution um, with, with like assortments of size K, for example. But uh, singletons is like certainly a feasible solution that we can just think of like out of, out, out of the top of our head. Like, yeah. I see. Okay. I was just like thinking maybe in the experiment, do you see like more like the optimal solution would be like singletons or like right. it would be like assortment with larger size that just speaks to the yeah. Denise point yeah. that you might, you know, like include yeah, yeah. this, you know, introduce this fairness notion, but practically you might restrict the size of your assortment yeah, to yeah. be like very small so that you can ensure this fairness visibility. Yeah. yeah. So practically speaking in our real world experiments, for example, like the assortment you're getting usually are off size k or close to k and actually when you take delta to be zero there will tend to be there might be like a few assortment with slightly smaller size so for example if k equals five there might be some sets of size three for example but when you take delta to be even larger almost all of the assortment will be of size k like almost yeah in that case because like when you relax it then it will be easier to just offer assortment with larger size that give you like higher market share or expected revenue or something like that all right. Uh, so one last question. Uh, Jake Feldman is asking, how much does the fairness uh, constraint decrease revenue, uh, either theoretically or from your experiments? Do you have All any? Right. So maybe I can that? share what I did not show you um, right. from the numerical experiments. Um, so yeah, actually, uh, let me see. So in the numerical experiments that I did not show. Uh, I was actually implementing this thing using uh, for maximizing market share because I was considering a movie data set and the movies do not have revenue. So uh, our goal becomes then to uh, maximize the market share. And I want to show you that even when this delta is like super small right, uh, right here. So when delta equals zero, uh, the loss in terms of this uh, market share uh, using the, uh, the half approximate solution right here actually uh, is actually just around 4% loss right here. So it's like a very little loss in terms of the market share. Uh, and we also see similar kind of things even in like much more difficult problems. So one synthetical, uh, synthetical experiments that we did is like with one product with very high popularity weight and then 
like end products with very low pop popularity weights. And that problem is more difficult. But in terms of the loss of market share, if I remember correctly, it's around like 15%. So it's not even like a big loss, in, even in the more difficult case. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's thank the speaker and the discussant again. Thank you. This session thank is all you. about clapping. Yeah, we're going to do a lot of clapping here. All right, so in the interest of time, let's actually move to the next spotlight talk. Uh, so we are happy to have Rajan Udwani, who is going to tell us about submodular order functions and assortment optimization. So after Rajan's talk, which is going to be 25 minutes followed by five minute questions, we are going to have Ali Awad, who is going to discuss the paper for us. With that, uh, the floor is yours, Rajan. Thank you. Can, uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Thanks. Um, hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Raj, for the kind introduction. So uh, this talk, um, I'll tell you a little bit about um, uh, this new notion of submodular order functions and uh, share with you uh, some applications to assortment optimization. So um, what is an assortment? So, so assortment really is just uh, a set of options and assortments are everywhere. So classic applications of revenue management uh, like airlines and network revenue management or retail and grocery stores uh, to online platforms uh, where uh, in, a, in a variety of ways we see these assortments and choices. Now the problem of assortment optimization at least as we'll uh, see it in the talk today is about um, Trying to find the best set of options to show when we are given uh, the model of customer choice. So I have a probabilistic model of how customers will choose. Um, and I want to find um, a set of options that uh, maximizes the expected revenue. So I'm thinking from a retailer's point of view, uh, finding an assortment uh, so that I can get the best revenue. Uh, and typically I want to solve this problem subject to constraints. So for example, we might have physical constraints like in a grocery store, uh, there's only so much you can display, or there might be constraints on the screen size. So on an app, you could only show maybe four options. So we want to try to find the best set of options to show to maximize expected revenue subject to some constraints. That's the problem that uh, at a high level we are interested in. Um, so let me try to make things a bit more formal. Um, I'll use this capital N to denote uh, my ground set, which is really just the set universe of all possible products from which I want to choose uh, a subset, which is my assortment. Uh, prices are all fixed. So for product I uh, in, in this ground set, and I have a fixed price RI. And this phi I of S, uh, I comma S, is uh, the choice probability. So if I show the assortment S, um, item I from S will be chosen with this probability if, I, if, if a random customer comes. So this is really my choice model. This distribution is given to me. And my objective is to try to maximize this revenue R of S. So the revenue of a set S is really just, if I look at an individual term here, it's the price of a product I times the probability that I would be chosen if S is shown. And I just sum it over all the um, items inside the set S. Uh, by linear of expectation, this is my expected revenue. Okay, so the high level problem of constraint assortment uh, optimization is to try to find a set S uh, subject to some constraints such that the revenue, uh, expected revenue is maximized and the kinds of constraints that we'll be interested in today uh, fall into these categories. So one constraint you can imagine is just a Carnati constraint. So the set of all feasible sets F um, is basically just any set that has at most K elements. Uh, more generally, you might have a budget constraint uh, where uh, you're generalizing the Carnati constraint by, uh, for instance, thinking about the space that a specific item I occupies. And you want to ensure that the total space occupied is at most some um, capital B. We'll also think about Metroid constraints, though I'll really focus for the sake of simplicity on Carnali constraints um, in the talk, but Metroid constraints can allow us to do joint pricing and assortment optimization. Okay, so if I give you this kind of problem that you want to try to find a set uh, subject to some constraints such that some uh, set function is maximized, uh, perhaps the first thing you will try to think about is, well, can I show that this uh, function has some nice properties like submodularity or supermodularity? Um, I'll also review in a bit what submodularity is, just in case uh, uh, that, that's, that's something that uh, you don't quite remember at the moment. Uh, but you can think about it as just a property like um, concavity or convexity. So 
It can be shown that even for very simple choice models, uh, unfortunately, this objective, a revenue objective, is neither monotone nor submodular or supermodular. And in fact, in general, if you think about a general class of choice models like the random utility model, there is really no hope for a good or reasonable approximation. And even if we don't have any constraints, we really cannot get any good approximation. This was showed by Oad et al. So in light of this, uh, and given the practical significance of trying to solve these assortment problems, the, the uh, approach so far, which has been very successful, is the following, that you don't try to look at the most general choice model necessarily, but you look at special classes of choice models that are very good for uh, handling certain uh, types of applications. And then you use the structure in those choice models to build tailored algorithms that have very good performance. So we can't solve the general problem. So we try to look at different structured choice models and build algorithms for these choice models. Okay, so the approach that uh, we'll try to see in, in this talk uh, tries to find some general structure. So we know that some modularity doesn't really um, uh, hold that there isn't that structure. Uh, so we generalize this notion of submodularity uh, and introduce submodular order uh, functions. And uh, this new notion of submodular order captures uh, Two fundamental uh, uh, choice models. One is a relaxation of mixed multinomial logit model, and the other is the Markov choice model. And I'll say a little bit about uh, this later on. Um, then we also give algorithms uh, for constraints some modular order maximization. In fact, we get, uh, give tight algorithms for cardinality and, and uh, budget constraints. And the end result is that as a result of thinking about this notion of submodular order, uh, we now have unified and scalable algorithms for uh, these choice models. Um, and in particular, even though this uh, is, a, is a more general framework, it leads to the first constant factor approximation results uh, for some problems. Okay, so let me start now with uh, a quick review of submodularity and monotonicity. So remember that we are thinking about set functions here. So a set function f um, will take any subset of my ground set n and map it to some real value. A set function is monotone if given two sets b B and A, where B is a small set, it's, it's contained inside of A, the value of A is at, at least as much uh, as the value of the function on the smaller set uh, B. So as you have a larger and larger set, your value does not shrink. Some modularity is about a marginal gain. So if I have an element E outside of these sets, then uh, some modularity tells me that uh, the marginal value that I get from adding E to the big set A is at most the value that I would get by adding E the smaller set. So the smaller my set, the more value I might get out of adding one new element. Okay. So a classic algorithm for maximizing submodular monotone submodular functions is the greedy algorithm, uh, especially I'm talking about Carnati constraints here, uh, proposed by Nemhauser, Wolsey, and Fisher. So this is really the most natural algorithm you might think of. If you want to try to find k elements to maximize the monotone submodular functions, well, just move it relatively. So at each step, pick an element that adds the best marginal value. So if at a current iteration, I have a set S and I can add an element, then I'll just try to find the element that has the best value, uh, adds the most value to my set S and just add it and keep doing this for k steps. But this greedy algorithm outputs a solution with value at least one minus one over A, which is like 63% of the optimal, uh, no matter what the instance. And in fact, it turns out this is the best possible performance guarantee achievable by any algorithm that only makes a polynomial number of queries. And generalizations of this greedy algorithm actually lead to tight guarantees for a variety of constraints, both budget and, and um, matroid constraints as well. Okay. So now let me tell you about uh, the notion of submodular order function. So crucial to this notion is um, that we are talking about an ordering over the ground set. So let me say that I'm given an ordering pi over the ground set, and I index for simplicity the elements of the ground set n in this ordering pi. So one, two, three, so on, till the last element of n, this is the ordering pi that I'm given. Now this order over the ground set is a submodular order if for any set A and an element E to the right of A in the order, the decreasing marginal gains property is satisfied. So to say that uh, one more time a bit more explicitly, if I'm given an element E to the right of some set A, the marginal value of E onto the set A is upper bounded by the marginal value of E on any subset B of A. 
but I only want this or enforce this on element C that are to the right of A. So if this is true, then this order pi is a submodular order. At a high level, this is just saying that in the order pi, you have submodularity. So notice that f, um, or, or rather, uh, I'll say that f is a submodular order function if there exists some submodular order. And notice that f is submodular if and only if every single permutation is a submodular order. So submodular functions are a special case of submodular order functions. OK, so let me take a quick example. Uh, so Raja, uh, yeah. there is a clapping question. I usually do not interrupt the speaker, but this one seems to be helping, helpful. Yeah. Do elements of A have to be in a consecutive uh, in the order pi? Yeah, good question. So no, they, they don't have to be uh, consecutive. This is just uh, the illustration might indicate that, but no, A can be any set. E just has to be to the right of it. Thank you for that question. OK, so let me take a quick example. Uh, so this is, um, um, you can think of it as a, a, an order or, or a ground set of size three. I have uh, these two elements, which both have singleton value one and a third element, which has slightly higher value. Epsilon is some small quantity. And if I look at both these elements together, the value is two. So these are basically like a modular subset of elements. I just add up the value. If I look at three with one, the value of the set one comma three, uh, or two comma three is just one plus epsilon. So the same as the value of three itself. So one and two don't add any marginal value um, if I already have the element three. If I look at all three elements, the value is two, same as the value of one and two. So now notice that this function that uh, we just defined is not submodular because if I look at the marginal value of element one on this set, uh, it just has the single three, it's zero, right? Uh, one, three has the same value as uh, just the singleton uh, set three. But if I look at the marginal value of one on the set two comma three, it actually has a significant value close to one. So, so modularity does not hold, but at the same time, it's not hard to see that this natural indexing one, two, three is actually a submodular order. Because when we are looking at submodular order, we really want to be looking at uh, comparing the value of these two sets. We don't enforce submodularity on these two sets because the element one is not to the right of two comma three. OK, so uh, this is the quick uh, overview of, of the approximation results that we'll show for submodular order maximization. So um, uh, the first column is the type of constraint. If you look at cardinality constraint and want to maximize a function that has a submodular order and we are given the submodular order, uh, then we can get um, an algorithm with guarantee 0.5 minus epsilon where the smaller the epsilon, the larger the runtime. So the runtime scales inversely as epsilon uh, the interesting thing to note is that for any fixed epsilon, this is really just uh, linear in the number of elements in the ground set. So this is as fast as just looking at each element in the ground set once, really. Um, I shouldn't say once, but a constant number of times. And turns out that this is really almost the best possible guarantee. So there can be no efficient algorithm that has a guarantee that is better than 0.5. For budget constraint, one can also get the same 0.5 minus epsilon guarantee, but the runtime starts to explode with epsilon. So we also have a fast algorithm that gets a slightly weaker guarantee, but has the same nearly linear runtime. And finally, for metroid constraints, one can get a 0.25 approximation um, uh, with a quadratic uh, runtime. And these results hold, in fact, under a weaker notion of submodular order uh, that, that's in the paper, and I can chat about it offline if somebody is curious. OK, so the overview of the rest of the talk is that I'll talk a little bit about the algorithms for some modular maximization and then um, discuss applications to assortment optimization and tell you a little bit about how the, uh, these results, the upper and lower bounds uh, for some modular order functions are shown. Uh, if there is still time, I'll uh, maybe say a little bit about also a connection to streaming maximization of some modular functions. OK. So let's go back to that example, a slight modification of that example, and try to see what happens to the natural greedy algorithm that does so well for submodular function. So I have the same example as before, except that now I've added another element, this two prime. So this two prime is an element with small value epsilon, small compared to the value of these elements, which is one and one plus epsilon. Uh, but when I consider the set two prime at three, the value is one plus two epsilon. So uh, these two elements are modular with respect to each other. Adding this element onto this element adds an epsilon directly. 
So now let's think about trying to find a set of size two, cardinality at most two, um, and let's run the greedy algorithm. So when we run the greedy algorithm, it will go pick this element three, which has the highest value amongst all elements. And then thereafter, it will try to pick the element which has adds the most value to my set three. So the element that adds the most value to three is just two prime. So greedy will pick two prime and three, it will have a value one plus epsilon, epsilon is tiny, but notice that um, this is the optimal set or solution, one and two, which has a value two. So greedy in this example has a gap of half. It, it misses the optimum by a factor of half, and you might think that's great, but unfortunately we can strengthen this example or counterexample to show that greedy in general will not perform well. So we just add k of these bad elements and k of those good elements, and greedy will again start by picking the last element and then it will get fooled. It, it uh, really will just end up picking these bad elements, whereas the optimal set was the set of these first k elements. And there's a gap of k. So greedy in the worst case has a performance one over k times optimal, and, and that's really uh, tight. So a thing to notice here is that the greedy algorithm is in some sense not doing so well because it's too aggressive. It goes and picks the element with the largest value, which is at the very end uh, of my submodular order. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit about the high level ideas that go into algorithms for submodular order functions. Greedy doesn't work, but uh, there are other algorithms that work. So there are two different types of algorithms uh, that um, um, I consider, and I'll try to tell you more about the threshold based approach here and, and leave some discussion, further discussion of uh, the other algorithm to do uh, offline discussions. So the threshold based idea is designed for cardinality and budget constraint. Uh, it does not work for matroid constraints. And uh, the high level idea is that uh, we don't want to be greedy, but we want to fix a threshold and try to pick elements that have margin value more than that threshold. The directed local search basically does a local search, but only along the submodular order. And it works for matroid constraints, even though threshold based approach does not. Okay, let me tell you a little bit more about this threshold based approach. And I'll really just talk about carnality constraint to keep things simple. So, Quickly remembering greedy fails because it's too aggressive. It starts by picking the last element in the submodular order. And why is that bad? Because the submodular order is a lifeline for us, right? If we look at elements in this order, we have some submodularity, but if I pick an element that is at the extreme right, then I lose submodularity and my algorithm doesn't know which element to pick next. Instead of um, picking the best element, we will try to look for a good enough element. So in particular, let's consider this algorithm where we'll parse the ground set, uh, look at each element one by one in submodular order. And when we visit an element, we'll just add it if we can, as long as the module value of this element is at least some. So I'm visiting elements one by one. When I visit an element, if it's adding a marginal value more than tau, I'll just add it. And I'll keep doing this until I have uh, k elements. Okay. So. Uh, well, very straightforward algorithm. The question is, what is this tau? If it's a really small value, then the algorithm will just pick the first elements and be done with it. And those elements won't really necessarily have a value. If it's very large, then nothing is fixed because all elements satisfy this threshold condition. So the right value of tau actually needs to depend on the instance. And uh, uh, we, we can't really just uh, 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 say what the value is right away. So what we'll do is just try out a few values. So in particular, it's okay to try some algorithmically many values uh, between the space. So one over k times the value of uh, maximum value of singleton, and the maximum value of tau that we care to try is the maximum possible value of any singleton element. So we'll try a few values between this range, and we'll basically fix a value of tau in this range and run the algorithm with it. And we can run these different copies of the algorithm for different values of tau in parallel. So in the end, we have a bunch of sets. We just pick the best one. So it's a very scalable algorithm. You just pick it out and run this algorithm that parses the ground set uh, one by one. OK, so I'll just say a little bit about the directed local search. Uh, since the threshold-based type of idea uh, can be generalized to budget constraints, but not to matroids, uh, or rather it doesn't work well for matroids, for matroids, we'll do a local uh, search in the direction of the submodular order. So we'll again parse the elements in the submodular order. Submodular order is salient for us. And the add element is feasible, uh, meaning that after adding it, I still have independence of the matroid. If the element uh, cannot get it, then I try to consider a swap. But when the swap element is something that needs a bit more care, uh, and this I'll leave to uh, offline discussions. 
Okay, so let me talk a little bit about um, application um, of, of uh, some motion order maximization uh, to constrain the assortment optimization. Okay, so in the, in the last talk, uh, uh, all of you saw multinomial logic, but I'll briefly just show you. So the multinomial logic choice model um, has this, is a choice model which is driven by these attraction parameters. So we have one attraction parameter for each product. Uh, given these parameters, the probability that an LSI is chosen from assortment S is proportional to the attraction parameter for element I, V, I, divided by the sum of the attraction parameters for all other elements uh, inside the set S and the outside option. So for this um, uh, choice model, uh, let's consider this uh, from the straight side function, f of s, which really, given the set s, the maximum possible revenue that I can get from any subset of s. So it would be that f of s is equal to r of s, but in general, f of s may be equal to some r of x, where x is a subset of s. Then um, I consider this function f of s, I can show that this function is monotone, in fact, for uh, general random usability ones and for MNL choice model, uh, the function also has a submodular order in uh, the direction of decreasing or non increasing uh, item prices. So if I look at this order given by non increasing item prices, that's a submodular order for this function f when my choice model is an MNL choice model. Let me tell you a little bit about this uh, uh, function f. So if I look at this function, I notice that I will really need to solve an unconstrained assortment optimization problem. So given a ground set S, evaluating of S, I need to solve an unconstrained MNL assortment optimization problem, which will tell me this best subset X of S. Okay, so given a solution for the unconstrained MNL choice model, you can evaluate of S model, it has a submodular order. So therefore, all the algorithms that uh, work for submodular order functions apply directly with their guarantees. So beyond MNL, MNL is something that's very well understood. So it's a starting point to see if, if this structure is even interesting for assortments to begin with. Uh, but we can show results for, for more sophisticated models. So uh, the first result that I want to talk a little bit about is that uh, a more general model, which is the MNL model with customization, also has some order order property in non-increasing order of prices. Uh, this one that was introduced uh, recently by Al Rusni and Topalo. In fact, uh, this is going to be the focus of an RMP talk, which I highly encourage you to attend. This is a very, very cool model that really uh, looks at a new way of thinking about uh, customization in assortments. And uh, I, I leave the deferred the discussion uh, of, of those details to the stock, but I'll just say that. This model generalizes MNL, but relaxes a mixture of MNL. So it's, it bridges a gap between a very hard and general model and the classic MNL model. And uh, one can uh, use those um, uh, model order results directly for MNL customization. The second model where we get results is the Marco plus model of Blanchard, Galigo, and Goyle. This is also a model that generalizes MNL and, in fact, many other choice models. Uh, interestingly, the revenue order is not a submodular order for this model, but a weaker notion of submodular uh, order applies here, and we get the same guarantees. Um, so these are two models which are both generalization of MNL, uh, but they are incomparable. So the MNL with customization is not a special case of Markov choice. Markov choice is not a special case of MNL with customization. So a priori, the algorithms looked very different for them, and it was not uh, really clear if there's any connection between them. But with the notion of submodular order functions, we get a unified set of algorithms, which are actually stronger guarantees in both models and then point to really a common underlying structure, uh, which otherwise may not have been as apparent. Okay. So now you might be thinking, fine, uh, ML with customization mark of choice, interesting to have results there. What if I have a different choice model? My application uh, does not really uh, uh, favor these two choice models. Will I be able to use this notion? So here's a checklist that you can run through to see if the notion of submodular order maximization might apply to give you um, um, some algorithms and standards of optimization in your choice model. So the first thing you want to check is for your choice model, is the unconstrained assortment problem efficiently solvable? So do you have an optimal algorithm that runs uh, efficiently? Even if you don't have something optimal, but have an FP task, unconstrained assortment problem, that first box uh, is, is a check. So if you have, um, let's say, an FP task for your unconstrained problem, then the next question is, is there a natural submodular order uh, for your choice model? So first thing to check is, really, is the decreasing or not increasing order of price is a submodular order? If it is, then you're done, right? If it isn't, but there is some other order, 
again, you can directly apply results from selection order maximization and uh, you get all the guarantees. Okay, so what if uh, there is no submodular order or you cannot find one? Let's say the actual revenue order is not submodular order and it's not clear if there is one, then what? So if that's the case, uh, I introduce a set of conditions which are called compatibility conditions. And if your choice model satisfies these compatibility criteria, then you can bypass finding a submodular order. So you don't need to worry about whether there is a submodular order. You can check these conditions. And if these conditions hold for your choice model, all the results apply directly. In particular, this is how um, uh, um, uh, we show that the Markov choice model uh, uh, admits all these guarantees and algorithms for submodular order maximization. OK. So Rajan, uh, you have yep. three to four minutes left. Thank you. All right, so let me say a little bit about uh, how one might prove upper and lower bounds for some order order maximization. So to prove lower bounds, which is to say approximation guarantees uh, for some modular functions, this is the only inequality you need to know. So you can set a partition of A into two sets E and O. The value of, of the set A is upper bounded by the value of E plus the marginal value of the set O uh, on top of E. And by using this in creative ways, you can essentially show all the guarantees for submodular functions. But this inequality does not hold for submodular order functions. So one can replace this with a slightly weaker family of inequality. To give you just a quick example, let's say that I can write A um, as this interleaved partition into O and E sets. And these sets are in the submodular order. So O1 is to the left of E1, is to the left of O2, and so on. Then if I have a modular function and have a strong inequality, in general, one can show a weaker inequality. And one can show a family of such weaker inequalities for some modular order functions, and these drive the analysis uh, for proving the approximation guarantee. Okay. So to prove the upper bound, uh, we basically want to use a needle in a haystack argument. When we design some modular order function, the optimal set is really unique and very interesting randomness. So if you want to try to find something about the optimal solution, you really just need to make exponentially many queries. Without making that many queries, you really don't get any information about the optimal solution, and you get stuck with a half comparative ratio can, uh, approximation. Can. So the upper bound, I just know this unconditional. It does not rely on any complexity theory assumptions. All right, so in the interest of time, um, I'll try to just uh, quickly go forward to the summary. So uh, to summarize, uh, we talked about a new notion of some modular uh, relaxation of some modularity, notion of some modular order functions where they have some modular some modularity only in some specific direction. Uh, we showed tight approximation guarantees under uh, budget constraints and show a quarter uh, guarantee under Metroid. One open question is can we do better for Metroid constraints uh, or can we improve the upper bound? Um, and we should have to for some optimization. There are also some connections uh, to streaming maximization. And I'm very curious to also see if there are other applications. Um, OK, so with that, I'll stop. Uh, thank you so much. All right, let's thank Raja. OK, uh, so uh, there are no more questions in the chat. I actually have a question, Raja. Yeah. Um, so thinking about the say Markov chain choice model with cardinality constraints or this adjusted greedy adjusted revenue greedy algorithm that gives you a half approximation, I yeah. was wondering what's the connection between the revenue order submodular algorithm and that algorithm. If there right. is so, that, uh, so uh, Rod was mentioning um, um, uh, this uh, algorithm from a paper by. Uh, uh, there's a at all uh, from, from 2018 uh, or 2016, which shows that for Markov chain constraint assortment optimization, one can get a half approximation. So that algorithm um, is a different algorithm from what comes out of uh, the submodular order uh, uh, notion when applied to Markov choice model. So um, the, 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 the similarity actually is uh, in the following sense. So that algorithm is somewhat similar to the Carnardi constraint algorithm for submodular order functions. Uh, but when I say somewhat similar, it's hiding some crucial differences. Uh, so yeah, uh, I, I can tell you more details, but the two algorithms end up being different. So the algorithm that comes out for Markov choice model from submodular order uh, functions is uh, actually not the same as the algorithm in that paper, but there are yeah. connections between them. Interesting, because what I have found very fascinating is that that algorithm visits the elements in, a, in an adaptive order. But yours is actually one non-adaptive ordering that is picked up front. So 
Right, right, right. Yes. Yeah. So uh, submodular order is, is kind of a fixed order, right? So uh, right. as a result, this algorithm naturally has the tendency to try to create um, a piecewise non-adaptive order, whereas that uh, algorithm um, really figures out a clever way to, to get this adopt, uh, adaptive uh, way to look at elements uh, in, in, in sort of the order of reduced prices. So that, that is actually what makes them different indeed. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there any other questions from the speaker? I have a quick it's question. Crazy. Let's Jake, go ahead. Hey Rajan, good, great talk. Um, I'm just wondering if you have your eye on any applications where you think this could be useful, where you're sort of hopeful. Um, um, you know, you, you obviously mentioned the uh, Omar and Hussein's personalization one. And that sort of is new, and I guess you sort of saw it and said, "Oh, I can, I can sort of apply this here." I'm wondering if there's sort of any other ideas that sort of um, you, you you don't necessarily know, but you're sort of hopeful maybe these ideas could work, assortment or otherwise. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, I am at the moment, I guess, uh, exploring or or uh, uh, sort of let's say close to trying to figure out uh, connections also to um, online allocation. Uh, so, so, uh, not, so, so I don't have necessarily other applications to different choice models that I've explored, but yeah, it seems like it, this has applications to online allocation uh, as well. Got it. So well, no pressure you. on Ali, but maybe we find the answer to some of these questions in his discussion. Right. <laughs> this is ambitious, but I might, I might raise uh, some similar questions actually. Uh, maybe help uh, gear them a little bit. Um, all right, so I'll share my screen and yes. um, I think I'll probably speak for about uh, 10 minutes. Do you see my screen? Yeah, we see your uh, screen. And, uh, the I'll, floor is yours. Perfect. And I'll, you conclude with a bunch of questions and, and, and um, you know, it would be great to, for everyone to, to join in. So, um, First of all, I, I was really delighted to to um, spend quality time with with Rajan's paper. I think um, on, on, on this new notion of sub, sub modular order functions, I think this is a, a very uh, technically intriguing and impressive works in, in many ways. I'll try to uh, first um, kind of summarize my understanding of the results and their significance, and um, maybe focus a little bit on two technical ideas that I found um, uh, quite quite interesting. Uh, and then uh, ask uh, Rajan a bunch of, of questions, some of which might be very stupid questions, but just to uh, make sure I understand uh, the work well. So I guess my understanding of, of the paper is that there's two lines of work that are running in parallel and that kind of nurture each other, but they're not exactly the same, they don't exactly um, coincide. So one line, line of contribution is about uh, this new notion of, of submodularity, so in a weaker notion of submodularity, the submodular order, um, that for which not only uh, Rajan proposes this uh, new notion, um, you know, shows its practicality, but also comes up with um, tight approximation algorithms in at least in the capacity uh, constraint setting. Um, and, and so as such, you know, this work really contributes to submodular optimization theory, um, in a way that kind of relaxes the assumptions and the set of functions that one can, can deal with. And, you know, beyond assortment optimization, if you want to think of a motivation or the way I think about how to motivate this uh, submodular order is that um, thinking about some form of weighted coverage functions as, as a motivation, I'm not sure if, if Rajan would agree with this, but in the sense that, you know, if you think about uh, assortment optimization, um, the reason why submodularity doesn't hold most of the time is because you have a, a weighted objective uh, with regards to the choice probabilities that kind of breaks the nice uh, so like diminishing returns that you, you would have otherwise thanks to the substitutability. Um, and, and it's not, in, in, in this sense, it's not surprising that the ordering that uh, Rajan proposes is based on the revenues, which are the weights that are applied on, um, on, on the coverage. So the reason I mentioned coverage function is because there is an analogy between, say, rank-based models and, and, and coverage functions. Um, so I think that's, that's to me, the gist of like what the hardness comes from and that motivates this uh, different form of, of submodularity. Um, and in parallel, uh, there is you know, a, a number of, of interesting uh, new approximation results for assortment optimization, which you know, serve both as a motivation for, for the, the structure that Rajan proposes, but um, I think um, propose also give also a unified class of algorithms for several uh, computational tasks related to assortment optimization. And here, 
Uh, I think the contribution is clearly uh, in proposing new methodologies and a unified framework for um, uh, assortment optimization, at least with two uh, case applications, the um, uh, cardinality constraint uh, market chain and capacity constraint market chain pro problem, as well as the um, personalized joint assortment and, and personalization problem uh, that's that has been introduced by El Hosni and Tobaloglu um, uh, recently. Um, and perhaps, you know, there will be other uh, applications of this, and that's perhaps uh, the, the questions that I will focus on um, later on. And the connection between these two things is that uh, this uh, submodular order kind of holds for uh, assortment optimization, at least in the MNL case, but it actually doesn't hold for Markov chain. So there are further generalizations and relaxations uh, that are operated in the paper. So there's this notion of piecewise submodular order that is I guess the most general version of, of, of the property that is uh, enabling uh, uh, you know, the application of this framework to uh, the assortment problem. Um, so I guess like the way the paper is presented is also allows to kind of highlight both you know, the general um, kind of clean notion of submodular order results, and then also um, when needed, kind of dig deeper into the structure of the assortment problem that would enable a successful application of, the, of these results. So I'd like to focus on two ideas that I find really interesting and intriguing that I think are tour de force in trying to uh, establish the results. So with regards to the first contribution, I think um, what I find um, you know, quite, quite neat is the ability to come up with a tight analysis or a kind of tight uh, approximations for um, uh, the, the constrained uh, weak submodular uh, order uh, um, problem. And the underlying uh, technical tool is um, actually a relaxation of the inequalities that are usually used in, in submodular uh, optimization to uh, come up with um, an, um, a, a, a lower bound on uh, the, the, the revenue generated by greedy decisions. So typically that's the upper inequality, which said that basically the union of uh, like the, the assortment, um, oh, sorry, the, the set that takes the union, that is formed by the union of two sets can be um, upper bounded by um, the, the value of one subpart of that set and uh, the marginal increments that can be generated starting from that set. And Rajan comes up uh, with a kind of a clever extension of this inequality or generalization of this inequality, whereby because the, the um, submodularity only holds um, on one direction, so when we add elements to the right, uh, we need to skip uh, certain elements. Um, uh, that's the distinction between um, uh, so that, that between you know the what I'm showing here with the blue uh, squares and the white squares, so that um, basically the the base set from which we're adding uh, the um, uh, uh, elements O of L uh, will be sh smaller than what it would be for submodular optimization. But this is just sufficient to come up with a, a half uh, approximation. So I think like that's really the cornerstone uh, inequality that um, enables the the, the analysis. Um, and I think it's a very, it's a very clever um, kind of extension uh, of, and it seems very tight in the way it is um, derived, including with this um, uh, the, the parameterization with the permutation sigma. Uh, All I right. Have a so, about your yeah. slide, actually. Yes. So uh, this partitioning into ELs that depends on O, right? Yes. So O is the blue. So let's think of mm -hmm. O and E are uh, being as being interleaved. Okay. So because they are interleaved. Uh, sometimes, you know, E is adding to the left of, uh, O is adding to the left of some elements of E. And as such, you know, we need to kind of skip, uh, um, so the, you know, the, the marginal contribution should not account for those elements. Otherwise, submodularity, the uh, order, the submodularity order doesn't hold. So you have to skip them uh, in, got, in the, got it. Yeah, what, is, what goes up, up right after the bar. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and what I find, like very intriguing actually, and that I, I, I don't fully, fully understand at this stage in, in the paper is like how, so I think like the first analysis for cardinality constraint and, capa uh, and to some extent capacity constraint as well, uh, you know, is really building on that inequality, but later on there are other challenges, which is that uh, you actually need to analyze the items that have been discarded along the way uh, when you're considering the local search algorithm for the most general type of constraints. 
but also when you're uh, analyzing the uh, assortment algorithm for Markov chain. So um, in that case, it's not just one pass. You're not analyzing just one pass of this greedy additions, uh, but in fact, you're uh, thinking of you know, the same element multiple times and keeping track of that. So I think like there's a lot of um, work in kind of understanding you know, what is exactly happening there. And I think that's, that's actually a very uh, interesting and uh, something, again, at this stage, I don't fully kind of understand. Um, and um, so the other thing that, you know, uh, I like the second tour de force in the paper is about, you know, how specific this notion of submodular order is. Um, so I, I, in some of my previous work, I, I had some ideas of, around using a notion of sub, a weak notion of submodularity we call restricted submodularity. Um, and that was, I think there's more connection between uh, that notion and, and your notion that than it might seem. I'm happy to chat about that offline, but basically requiring submodularity within a region in which the revenue function is monotone. So to get rid of the problem of you know, adding um, certain um, elements to the set that are not uh, improving, pushing the, the revenue high, higher. And th this was very specific to MNL. And in that case, we got like actually a weaker uh, approximation of one half times one minus one over E. And I think we were kind of hacking some something that is in fact, I think and it is possible that um, your notion of some modular order is in fact generalizing this. And I'm happy to talk about that offline. Um, so what actually surprised me is the order you picked in, 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 um, in defining this modular order. So for me, the natural order was not, um, uh, you know, from the, the pro natural processing order would not have been uh, from uh, um, uh, adding elements to the right, but in fact, which are have lower revenues, but in fact, adding elements to the left. So there was a question by Rajan about connection with the local ratio algorithm by the uh, Zier et al. So in their case, they were constantly adding uh, the product that had the highest revenue, adjusted revenue. Um, and because in assortment optimization, it's not that costly to add a high revenue item uh, because high revenue items are uh, basically beneficial to, to your revenue. Like the cannibalization, the substitution can only, can only help out. So I would have thought that adding those elements, you know, preserve some modularity, uh, but it was, it's quite the contrary. So in your case, it's adding elements to the right, adding rev uh, elements of lower revenue. Uh, that would uh, yield the desired property. So in fact, I had to convince myself, then I thought that maybe the order didn't matter. And I had to convince myself that this was the, the, the right order. So I tried to prove or uh, show that, um, understand whether, do I have it on the slide? Yes, whether the opposite order might work and it doesn't. Um, so if you're adding, you know, say product one that has um, high revenue, but low weight, um, and initially you have the sets either two and three or the set that only comprises three, then adding one to, to three doesn't, doesn't help out because three is cannibalizing all the revenue. Uh, but if you already have two, then adding one, there's like a positive synergy between one and two because they can both of them um, uh, you know, increase the market share and result in higher revenue assortment. Um, so, so that was you know, kind of contradicting you know, my intuition that the order should be uh, the opposite one. And um, all right, so just for sake of time, here are my questions. I'll try to maybe go very quickly on them and let you kind of pick which ones you want to answer. So um, there's something that maybe can find slightly confusing is that, um, you know, ultimately for the Markov chain model, you rely on this uh, weaker notion of piecewise submodular order. Um, and you say that the results carry over in that setting, but it was not exactly clear to me, especially in the statement of, of the result, whether, you know, um, actually, you know, your paper could generalize fully to piecewise submodular order, or if you still needed the compatibility property for the, the choice models to, to make this work. So that was not entirely clear to me. And then that raises the question of why not write the paper you know, from, from the get-go with that uh, kind of more general notion. Um, I was curious if you had some thoughts on how to compute the order, if you know that the, the choice model is kind of satisfies some submodular order, whether that, that is easy or not. Um, I found it really interesting to think about query complexity in the context of assortment optimization. So I was wondering if perhaps you know you could we could get new hardness results um, by by having this kind of more limited knowledge of the underlying uh, problem. And I think there's also some work on uh, query complexity for submodular optimization with noisy evaluations, uh, which could be like a very nice framework to do assortment optimization when. You don't estimate then optimize, but when you kind of want to go directly from the query and the data you get from the query to a decision. So I'd be curious to hear if you think that's a promising venue for research. Um, and then uh, I think mentioned quite quite 
like some potential other extensions or applications. There's one that I have in mind that I think uh, may, maybe um, could be interesting is to think about dynamic substitution models where you have multiple consumers coming. Um, and in that case, the unconstrained problem is actually uh, pretty time solvable. So it, it kind of fits with one of the requirements of your framework. Um, and there is a set function representation of those problems. Um, yeah, so that's something if I have some time, I would be uh, kind of interested to think about. And then uh, lastly, I know I'm, I'm just questioning also this unifying framework for the class of algorithms. So, um, you know, there's the paper by, by Antoine there's, and, and, and Vinit, uh, but there, and, and um, uh, Yun as, as well. And there, there's also a paper by Srikan that looks at the local search for MNL. And I think maybe Srikan's paper can fit in your framework, I'm not sure. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious to hear, do you think this is a, a good framework to unify algorithms for a certain optimization? And I'm, I'm not exactly convinced actually by, by that, but uh, yeah, from a practical perspective. So that, 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 those were my questions, and, and please, uh, Rajan, feel free to answer which ones, uh, whichever ones you, you can. Thank you, Ali. Th 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 thank you so much for for uh, the, the uh, sort of really uh, you you pinpointed um, some of the questions that even uh, I, I have thought about, but uh, don't necessarily uh, know the answers to. But the questions that I think are the most important ones. So um, I, I'll do my best to try to give some idea uh, uh, about each one. So. Um, I guess uh, to the first question, uh, piecewise submodular order, uh, is that the unifying property? So um, uh, I guess the way uh, I, was, uh, I was thinking about it when I um, uh, wrote up the paper or was uh, deriving the results was that um, when um, I have some function where it's uh, not clear if there is a submodular order, um, and, and, and basically I don't know, don't can't prove that there is no submodular order, nor can I find one. Um, in that case, how could I go about um, still, you know, building a submodular order um, uh, or, or getting some guarantees? Uh, so the way I saw the piecewise submodular order um, is, is that um, it's uh, really a way to build uh, a submodular order, uh, though not one that is actually uh, fully submodular order, but, but only in pieces. Um, so it's uh, the, the intriguing question would be that um, are there uh, let's say objectives which don't have any submodular order uh, and yet do have piecewise order? If that's true, then uh, absolutely. I think piecewise submodular order is actually then the underlying unifying property. Uh, but uh, I, I don't quite have an answer to that question. So uh, I arrived at this piecewise notion because I couldn't find a submodular order. Um, um, and and it's it's a way to get around, I guess, also the second question you asked. So uh, in general, I don't know uh, sort of how you would compute um, um, or try to determine if there is a submodular order. Or let's say that somebody tells you that this function has some submodular order, but I'm not going to tell you what that order is. Then can you still get interesting guarantees? So so this was actually an open problem um, also that, that I partly mentioned uh, at the end of the paper. So these are questions um, that that I think are very interesting and. Um, uh, so the, basically to summarize for the first two questions really, when uh, it's not clear if there is a submodular order, uh, but you feel that there may be, uh, then this piecewise notion and the algorithm for uh, compatible choice models gives maybe some way uh, to try to um, figure out what uh, that partial order at least might be. Um, and I'm happy to, I guess, I guess if I miss something, uh, follow up uh, after afterwards. And and to go to the third question, um, uh, so uh, query complexity of assortment optimization. Uh, yes, this this I guess could be uh, quite interesting. That somebody uh, tells you that um, you can show this assortment many many times, and through that uh, you can get a rough idea what uh, the value of an assortment is, the expected revenue is, and then. Uh, can one try to do interesting things uh, in terms of uh, what's been done in, for some modular optimization for assortment optimization, like noisy oracles or um, adaptivity, et cetera. Um, um, I have thought a little bit about where this might apply directly and whether this would give something on top of uh, sort of this approach where uh, we have an, an explicit definition of the choice model and therefore an explicit way to compute uh, the, the, the expected revenue. Uh, and that part, I don't have an answer to whether this would uh, have applications uh, on top of what we already do for assortment optimization. Um, so the fourth one, other applications, um, uh, Jake, Jake asked a little bit. So 
uh, I am exploring some applications uh, in, 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 in a different direction, but I find the question of uh, trying to figure out uh, some connections to dynamic substitution and also uh, the, the structure of restrictive submodularity that Ali mentioned, uh, that, that is uh, also a potential direction that I don't have an answer to, but uh, I had the sense uh, once when I was thinking about it a little bit that uh, it might be useful. Uh, to get some um, new approximation results there as well. So I think dynamic substitution model could very well have um, a connection. Uh, nested logit, uh, I, I guess I'm reasonably sure that actually there is some counterexample that shows that um, uh, the revenue order is not a uh, submodular order for nested logit. Uh, whether it's compatible, I don't know. So checking the compatibility conditions uh, need, I guess, a good understanding. Uh, it's not trivial to try to prove compatibility of a choice model, even though the conditions are uh, clearly laid out. So it needs some thought. So I haven't yet checked if nested logit uh, is a compatible choice model, but I'm reasonably sure that it does not have submodular order um, in the direction of uh, decreasing prices. Um, and okay, yeah, so then the final question. Um, Connection to um, uh, uh, the, the, the Markov chain constraint assortment optimization work that, that, that uh, uh, um, I guess relates to the question Radha. So indeed, uh, 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 as I guess Radha actually pointed out in the end, um, uh, that algorithm uh, uses a non-adaptive uh, way to look at elements. Uh, whereas the algorithm that comes out of some order order functions is, uh, sorry, that algorithm uses an adaptive ordering of looking at elements. Whereas the algorithm that comes out of submodular order functions uh, tries to build a non-adaptive order over elements. Um, so there is definitely a connection in the sense that I was inspired by the Markov chain uh, constraint assortment optimization uh, to think about these notions. And that was really the problem that drove me to try to figure out something. Uh, but there are also, I guess, important differences once we start going down into the details. Um, but to show that the Markov chain choice model is compatible, um, I really use uh, the properties that uh, are derived um, in this paper uh, by Desert. So even though the algorithms have differences, the properties that they show are in some sense uh, really distilling the, the main things of a Markov chain choice model uh, and get used to show compatibility of that choice model. Um, the, the paper uh, local search uh, result by uh, Jagabatula. So actually that local search algorithm uh, 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 works for MNL, but when I was trying to figure out if it works for Markov, my sense was that it would in general not work for uh, Markov choice models and, and not for uh, some modular order functions. So uh, the local search algorithm for some modular order functions needs a very careful um, uh, swap criteria, which, uh, which is a little bit different from, from uh, the, the one that works for MNL uh, that, that uh, Srikant proposed. Uh, but nonetheless, both of them share uh, commonality in that they are local search procedures. Um, TOM constraints. So uh, uh, Metroid constraints, I guess, was uh, my way of substituting for TOM constraints. I don't know if the results uh, would hold there, but at least the kinds of uh, places where we use TOM constraints for, like uh, joint pricing or maybe in display optimization, uh, Metroids can also substitute. Partition Metroids can play the same role. Uh, but yeah, I don't know if one can uh, generalize a modular order maximization for uh, totally unimodular constraints. Um, yeah, I, if, if I miss something or any follow-up, uh, yeah, just uh, feel All free right. to ask. <clears throat> Thank you, Rajan. Thank you, Ali, for the intriguing discussion. Uh, as much as I love to continue this discussion, but unfortunately, we are kind of tight in time. Uh, the next session is going to start soon. Thanks, everyone, for the great talks and the great discussion. Uh, with that, I would like to conclude the session. Uh, looking forward to seeing you around and continuing conversations about papers in this.